This session is a big part of Smart Line in that it is about sensing the home. And it will go through the role and the value of the remote internal environment, this has been written for me, monitoring technology to create healthy homes and improve health and well-being. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is introduce you to the panel. So we have Tam, we have Tim, and we have Richard. Okay, so Tam is a Smart Line Research Fellow and in Data Analytics at the University of Exeter. Tam really is developing data-driven models for extracting patterns and relationships in the data for the Smart Line project. Welcome, Tam. Joining Tam is Dr. Tim Walker, and he is a social ge geographer by training with a least with an interest in action research. Alongside Tam and Tim is Dr. Richard Woods. Now he has a background working with data sets from ecology, behaviour and human wildlife conflict, and he is now part of the team at Smart Line. Joining him on the panel will be Anthony Ball who is an advanced public health practitioner working in the NHS and Cornwall Council since 2008. And if you look behind you, there he is. <laughs> he will be joining us for the question and answers part of this session. Just to give you a bit of an insight into Anthony Ball when he does join us, in that he has developed a multi-agency winter, winter wellbeing partnership across Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, and he has managed to secure at least £30 million worth of investment for, across various tenures to help reduce fuel poverty, improve health and work links all across Corn on the Isles of Scilly. So we have a very, very good panel. So over to Tam, who will start the session. Thank you, Joy. So first of all, I'm going to give a brief overview of Smartline participants and the sensor network. Um, then Tim's going to tell us about the sensor system in the Smartline homes. Then I'll describe some of the findings that we've um, had from the research that we've done with the sensor data. And then Richard will talk about um, the sensor data set in a bit more detail. So we have more than 300 participants on Smartline who've kindly answered our surveys and had sensors installed in their homes. In the face-to-face -face survey, um, almost all participants reported as being white, with two-thirds being female, and the average age at the time of the survey in 2017-2018 was 56. A fifth of the participants had no internet connection at home when we started the study, and the average amount of time reported to be spent inside the home was 19 and a half hours a day, which may, and that was pre-COVID. So that might sound like a lot, but just take a moment to think how much time you spend inside your home. And in our group, 6% of participants reported that they spend 24 hours a day, every day at home. From our sensors, we have measures of air temperature, relative humidity and air quality. Um, with VOCs or volatile organic compounds which are generated by things like um, perfumes and cleaning products um, and particulate matter of size 2.5 micrometers which is about the thickness of a spider's web um, PM 2.5 and that's created by dust in the air so um, generated by things like cooking, smoking, water droplets. Um, the reason for measuring air quality was because we wanted to see the relationship with health. But before Smartline, there was actually very little research on indoor air quality. We also have external sensors outside some of the homes uh, measuring temperature, humidity, and air quality. And we're measuring electricity use in homes and then gas and water use in some of the homes. So why is it important to monitor the indoor environment? Well, we spend about 80% of our time indoors and um, one of the main impacts uh, that housing can have um, on our health is through that indoor environment. Air temperature, humidity and um, air quality can impact on cardiovascular, respiratory and allergic diseases but it also affects our mental health and it can um, be associated with 
um, adverse social issues as well. But detecting a poor indoor environment is really difficult because the causes are often invisible, um, the impact on health is long term, um, cumulative, and it's often only identified retrospectively. So monitoring the indoor environment can provide, um, with sensors, can provide that real-time information um, so that we can then evaluate any health risks. So now I'm going to hand over to Tim, who's going to tell us about the sensor system. Tim. Hello, everybody. So yes, I'm Tim Walker, and I'm going to talk to you about our research, which has looked into, looked into improving homes and health uh, with, with sensor systems. And the two key questions we've asked are, are the sensor systems acceptable to social housing occupants, and are they effective for improving homes and health? <clears throat> so this is a diagram of the sensor system that SmartLine has developed, and I'll explain to you how it works. Um, as Tam has explained, the homes are monitored with sensors. This data then travels to a university server where that data is kind of processed, um, our calculations are applied and it's sent into sort of in useful insight. This data then travels to two dashboards we've developed, one for the occupant where the readings are presented um, and tips and hints are provided about what, what could be done to improve the home environment. Um, and then the data also travels to the housing association dash dashboard, which is Coastline News. Um, where they have a bird's eye view of all of the properties and kind of, kind of identify um, what's going on over across the, 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 the properties. And the final part of the system is the uh, Housing Association support team, and I'll give you the most crucial part of it. And these guys monitor the dashboard and are identified, able to identify high-risk homes and intervene. So that's the system and how it works. How did we develop it? Um, so we employed a living labs type approach. Uh, this is all about focusing on the real life environment of uh, living in social housing in Cornwall with its particular climate and particular building characteristics about co-creation. So we um, ran a number of uh, co-design workshops to develop the dashboard um, but about multiple methods. So we drew from the sensor data, interviews, focus groups um, and, sur and survey data to kind of understand the issues. And all of this was kind of an iterative process of exploration, experimentation and evaluation. So one of the key outputs from the co-design workshops was the development of these two dashboards. And they're really focused on kind of under, these workshops are understanding about understanding the needs of the users and then developing something that was appropriate. So oh, wrong button. Um, so this is the uh, so for the occupant dashboard, um, the key need from from their perspectives was to be intuitive and easy to use. So we developed a traffic light color coding to communicate the risk. Uh, provided explanations of what the sensors meant uh, in terms of those risks, tips and advice on what could be done, and timescales of plots. So they're able to zoom in on their property, look what happened in the last hour or the last month, um, and understand their home. From the coastline perspective, it was very much risk-focused. Um, that was the most important fact for them. So this bird's eye view of all of the properties enabled them to quickly identify which homes were um, had particularly uh, high living room temperature or, or high humidity. They were able to, the, the, the team were able to kind of sort this dashboard to, to, to kind of um, put the highest risk at the top. And then, again, they're able to zoom into that property to understand what's going on and if it's a prolonged case or if it's um, it just happened that day. So um, co-design is written into uh, a lot of research and innovation projects these days. So it's worth reflecting a little bit on the kind of values and challenges of doing this work. So. Uh, one of the key values was, was gaining the practical wisdom on what is sensible to, to pursue rather than what's technologically possible. So there are thousands of technologies out there, but by working with the end users and the people who are going to kind of benefit from the technology, you can make something useful um, that is actually fit for purpose in that context. And that will be context for that context will be different um, across the country. Um, the process is very creative, so it was actually quite a fun process uh, with, with, to, to, to run with the participants. So the actual user testing group, kind of, I think they enjoyed it. I certainly did. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, one of the challenges was recruiting a diverse user testing group. So we ran our, our co-design workshops online during COVID, which wasn't ideal to in, um, enable kind of diversity and inclusion um, and something that could be improved in the future. It also requires a team with a diverse skill set. So luckily in SmartLine, it's a very interdisciplinary team. So we, we need to draw from kind of social scientists, people, experts in housing, software developers to kind of develop this system. And then the final challenge is just um, implementing all the new ideas in the, in the scope of SmartLine. So moving on to think about evaluation. 
Our research questions were, was the system acceptable to the social housing occupants? Was it used and was it, was it effective and useful? Um, thinking about acceptability, one of the kind of known factors in the research around acceptability is attitudes. And the ability of senses is that they can uh, reveal behaviours and lifestyle choices um, potentially in, in the home. So this can potentially lead to a fear of, of privacy intrusion and, and data misuse and this kind of big brother effect. And it's something we were really concerned about at the beginning of the project. Um, and uh, we developed a tagline that kind of tried to ameliorate that, that thing. Other factors that we know for kind of around factors that affect technology adoption are kind of perceived usefulness, uh, available technical support to, to, to help new users use that te technology, and of course, cost. So what did we find? Was the system acceptable? We did find a general concern among the social housing occupants around, uh, data, around data privacy and, um, and data use, but what we found was that there was a, uh, this was mediated, moderated with a trusting relationship that had been developed um, by Coastline over many, many years. Um, and therefore, Coastline were um, perceived as having credible intentions for what, uh, how they'd managed that data, and, and, the, and the occupants felt safe with, with, with how that was going to be used. In terms of perceived usefulness, there was a sense that they felt part of the coastline community and therefore they felt being part of the project would actually improve the design and management of future social housing. So there's almost altruistic kind of community um, participation aspect to, to, to the project in terms of why it would be useful. But interestingly, we found no kind of health related expectations for them in terms of how they kind of expected to benefit from the technology. Was the system used? So what we found was a high, there was very high uh, intention to use the technology initially, um, but actual quite long term, low long term use. And this is similar to research around uh, smart meter technology around that long, 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 long term use. And we found few changes in how occupants actually manage their home occurring as a result of using the dashboard. So we can look at uh, use of the dashboard and then we can look at the sensor data and see if, if say, for example, any action had been taken after using the, the dashboard. And we found kind of a few examples of this. On the other hand, we found Coastline um, were regular and successful users of this. They're able to identify high-risk homes and intervene. And uh, what we interestingly found was that the system is more useful in the winter um, because things like low temperature and high humidity are more prevalent and they're, they're more at risk. But given um, climate change, it may also be that the high temperatures in the summer are also a concern. So that, that may change. But in our study, that was the period that was most useful. So uh, to give you some examples of how this system works in practice, then I've got, I've got two here. So example one was a family. Um, a high humidity was spotted on the on, on the dashboards um, on the property. This sparked a property visit from the support team, and the property was found to have mould in it, and this was uh, caused by a large fish tank uh, and vivarium. So, what followed was intervention by the uh, coastline, and they provided advice and guidance on on better ventilation, able to replace the flat fans, and installed a positive input ventilation system which applies pressure from the top of the house to reduce uh, damp and mold. So example two is a, is a, more, com a more complex one. Um, this was uh, a, a prolonged drop in temperature was uh, identified on the dashboard and uh, on the property visit it, it was found that there was a fuel poverty issue and this was caused by changing circumstances due to benefits and, and, and income loss. And what followed was kind of a long list of actions that Coastline kind of pursued to support that person to improve their health and well-being. So um, in the first instance, an emergency hardship fund was provided. Uh, there was support to get a COVID uh, winter grant from the council. Um, there was engagement with a local energy charity to get them on a better tariff um, to be more competitive tariff. Um, and from a, from a housing management point of view, the, the interesting thing about this case was that the property is actually rated high in terms of its EPC, but on the visit, the surveyors found that the loft insulation had been removed um, by a previous tenant to create space. And obviously that was causing the high cost of rent of, of, of heating the property. Um, but what that shows is, um, and Mark's talked about how, how that, you might think a property is performing in a certain way, but actually the census can uh, kind of indicate something d different is, is happening. And that can be really useful for improving um, kind of how homes, uh, how healthy, how healthy homes are. So we conducted lots of inter uh, a number of interviews with, with coastline staff about the usefulness um, in, in terms of improving health. Um, it's useful for identifying and prioritizing at risk and vulnerable customers, enabling early intervention to support occupant health and well-being, and as potential way to reduce stress amongst the coastline staff because if um, you can enable kind of early intervention or early kind of preventative measures, it, 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 um, 
it stops the number of people coming in crisis to the coastline team, which then have to put in a, a number of issues, um, measures in quickly, and that can be quite stressful for the staff and, and quite dis disturbing. There are, of course, some risks and limitations with adopting this technology. Once the data comes in, there is a responsibility to act. Um, the Housing Association, because disrepair claims could come in, or, or so there is a, there's, there's a risk with taking on this technology. There's also uh, a limitation around the resources and capacity to act, as example with as is, as an example um, in example two, um, some of these issues might s stem into things that are traditionally covered by social or healthcare or, or voluntary sector organisations. So, um, kind of yeah, the issues identified maybe go beyond the traditional role of a housing association. Is the system useful for improving homes? Um, we found that it's clearly is it's useful for clearly and pro proactively identifying building and maintenance issues. Uh, you can reduce long-term costs by doing those uh, by doing proactive repairs and efficient planning um, of maintenance work, and also provides insight into kind of achieving that carbon net zero strategy and that live data to evaluate progress. So, conclusions: um, Yes, the system is uh, useful for identifying risks, but it really needs to be also matched with that human capacity for intervention and, and social support. It, the technology can't do that stuff on its own. Um, all of this research and this innovation that we've done in, in SmartLine really would not be possible without involvement of the users, the, the, the uh, provision of data, but also involvement in kind of designing the, uh, this system. So um, co-design is really important with this type of technology, which kind of brings humans and people together quite closely. And the final point is that um, housing associations are really unique, uniquely placed as intermediaries to improve health and well-being among populations that often face uh, social and health inequities, which has been discussed already, pointed out already. Um, and yeah, that's me. I'm going to pass. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to pass back to Tam. Thank you. So now I'm going to briefly outline some of the findings that we've um, had from researching with the sensor data. So just before I get into a couple of projects in um, more detail, just some headline findings um, asking how the indoor environment <laughs> Um, it is related to health and behaviours in the home. Um, so we found that the levels of PM2.5 in the home are not significantly affected by vaping inside um, once smoking is taken into account. So that could be useful for health research, but also for public messaging around vaping. Um, the risk of asthma increases with the mould or mouldy odour in the home and also with VOCs, volatile organic compounds, to the extent that we recommend household cleaning products should carry a health warning to ventilate when using them, which many of them don't. A colder home is associated with greater mental health risk um, and fuel poverty indicators are self-reported more um, from people with exi existing health conditions, um, which suggests that fuel poverty definitions and policies need to be more flexible to take into account flexible warmth standards or temperatures within the home that account for these underlying existing health conditions in the home. So next, um, during COVID, we were all advised to stay at home and then we were instructed to stay at home. And we had periods of strict lockdown where uh, we were, the staying at home was enforced interspersed with periods where we, it was recommended that we stay at home between those lockdowns. So we wanted to see in the sensor data, can we detect um, evidence for behaviour change during those different periods? So here I have a plot of the electricity usage um, running from mid, uh, a daily pattern running from midnight to the following midnight. In red is during the strict lockdown, the first strict lockdown that we had for COVID. And in blue are the data from 2019 when there's no lockdown. We can see in both years there's a peak use at around 5 p.m. But in the lockdown, the usage shifted later in the day, so decreasing at 6 a.m. and increasing at midday. And then it was used later into the evening. And we saw a similar pattern with water where the morning usage um, shifted later in the day. Excuse me. <coughs> so these findings together are consistent with people getting up later. So maybe that's not surprising. We were all spending more time at home and we didn't have 
the time pressure of um, the, the school run or the commute to work. But what is really interesting is that we can detect be population behaviour change in these sensor data. And also, um, we found these patterns during lockdowns, but not between lockdowns, despite the guidance to, to um, stay at home. So people were taking the enforced message uh, more seriously than the um, recommendations, which could be useful for future uh, public messaging as well. So we've also been researching mould, and we've um, shown that mould impacts on health. So can we model mould growth um, so that we might be able to predict it and prevent it? So here is a plot of relative humidity in red and temperature in blue from one home over one year. And the black line shows the critical relative humidity level above which mould can grow. So we can see at the beginning of the plot, the relative humidity is below that black line, and then it raises, rises above that critical level. So we took an existing um, lab developed controlled model of um, mould growth that takes relative humidity and temperature and generates a mould index. And we adapted that model to work in these noisy domestic environments um, using measures from the air. So the red line shows the output from the model based on the previous humidity data. Um, the mould index decreases when the relative humidity was below that black critical line. And then the mould index in red increases um, when the relative humidity level is above. So to check whether the model results um, are correct, we compared them with occupant responses about whether they have mould or mouldy odour in their home. And we found that the model could correctly categorise a home as having mould or not in 70% of cases. So we've been speaking with um, sensor providers about adding value to their sensors, so not just to provide information about humidity, but um, inform action about mould reduction. Um, Modelling can also be useful for building management, so with a bird's eye view that Tim was talking about on the dashboard, um, mould risk can be identified and acted on. Um, and also moving into the future, the dynamic nature of this model um, could inform smart control of heating and ventilation. Um, so to predict um, the humidity levels and predict that mould growth and intervene in um, a preventative way rather than in a reactive way. So all of those options would in turn um, reduce the adverse effect on, on health as well. So now I'm going to hand over to Richard, who's going to talk more about the data set. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Richard Woods. Um, my job is basically been to come in and um, sort out the data set and clean it up and find the faults and um, push towards publishing it. And um, my job today is to um, show why it's useful and why hopefully some of you should um, be interested in looking at it. So um, the two key things about the data are the, the quantity and the quality of it. So um, some more maths for you because we're short of that today. Um, 300 homes, seven sensors in each home, up to 15 parameters per property being recorded every three to 30 minutes um, since 2017. So you've all got there before me, but that's 7, 0.7 billion data points, which if you printed them size 14 font, one row per data point, <laughs> would reach from St. Austell to Senegal. So um, I was trying to find St. Austell to Saint somewhere, but they're all the wrong, wrong distance anyway. Um, so it's unique in space and time. Um, Cornwall, um, renowned as a beautiful holiday destination, but the truth, as we all know, it's most of the year it's really humid and it rains. And um, if you want to study a lot of the things that we've talked about today and things that are prominent, sadly, on the news at the moment, you are best looking at um, data from places where humidity is a problem. And certainly down here, we, we, we have that. Um, we've got a broad range of occupants um, in the properties that we have collected data from, and we know quite a lot about them, um, thanks to surveys and thanks to information collected by Coastline. Um, so we're, we're uniquely placed to answer 
um, questions about the participants, but also in the benefit of having a mixture of properties. They're not all just uniform um, flats or they're, they're, they're not all uniform terraced houses. There's a mixture of properties. So by having all those um, variables, you can ask a huge range of questions. So um, unique in time, because we're placed in um, a period that covers COVID, um, which as Tam has already mentioned, has made some big changes visible in the data. Um, we've had local climate extremes. So this year, I don't know what we'll get to by the end of the year, but it's been unseasonably warm. It's been incredibly dry. You can walk across one of our biggest reservoirs from the hut that is normally a water sports center. You can just walk straight across at the moment. So we're really dry this year. Um, and we're covering a cost of living crisis that we're all in the midst of at the moment that's having some profound effects across not just here, but globally. Um, moving on to existing outputs, I think as Tim has, has focused on and several people have made a point of, which is really one of the best take homes, I think, from the whole thing is that we've been able to give people the data from their own home and allow them to make changes. But importantly, where they haven't seen problems in their own data, we've been given oversight to Coastline who are able to see problems occurring and help people in real time. Um, which really, when you, when you watch the things on the news at the moment, that kind of thing should be making its way not, into, not just into good practice, but into law and into policy. Um, so we've got a very diverse published data set uh, research that Tam has already talked about, so I won't cover that too much. But um, the key thing about our data is that rather than just having sensor data or just monitoring people's um, energy usage or something like that, we've got data from the sensors. We've got data from um, coastline about the fabric of the buildings and the construction and the sizes and a whole array of things. And we've got real information about the occupants. And I think those three key threads really make this data set rich and powerful. So the future legacy um, really supports people who want to take our data and ask questions that perhaps haven't been come up with yet and look back. And because we've got this that huge array of three different strands of people, houses and sensor data, um, you can really ask some very detailed questions on a myriad of topics. So um, that's supported again by the sheer size of the data set. So because it's very, very detailed and it's run for a long time, you can filter out things like annual effects or you can filter out daily effects. And then you can start to look at what are these other things that are happening in the data? What, 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 what other little trends are there? We had a company approach us just last week that wanted to look at um, how people could turn their boilers down to a lower flow temperature. And that, that's a massive increase in um, efficiency on a condensing gas boiler and something that's being pushed by several organizations. You've seen it on the BBC, hopefully. Um, and by having such detailed data in our um, smart line data set, you can go back and you can look at how quickly the temperature in the property rises in the morning when some, someone's heating kicks in. And from that, steepness of that you can say ah oh, they've got a higher or a lower flow temperature so then even without knowing what they've got their boiler set to you can look at the houses that have got really high flow temperatures and you can look how much energy they've used and you can work out what their bills would have been relative to a comparable property that had a, a slower increase because their flow temperature was lower they all got to the same temperature eventually but one of them was spending a lot more money and um doing a lot more damage to the environment. So that's um, just an example of looking back and benefiting from that detail and that depth. So the good thing about the data um, that we are publishing is that um, there's going to be a lot that is going to be made public publicly available. And um, we've been very, very conscientious about getting as much data and as rich a data set as possible published that um, still maintains anonymity to participants. And um, by um, data sharing agreements and very careful um, back and forth conversations with other organizations, we could even share more metadata than it will be publicly available. Um, so there's a lot to be gained. Um, and that makes the data 
relevant to myriad research topics. So health and well-being, uh, fuel poverty, the energy crisis, um, so on and so forth. I don't need to explain to all of you in the room. Um, but one thing I would like to just put our hands up and say is this has not been easy. And should you um, take the view that, oh, I can get this data elsewhere, it's really, really hard. I mean, we start with this literal heap of Lego. I wish it was beautifully color coded like that. But, um, and quite often between where it says data and sorted, we find a fault already and we have to go back to the data and find out why the fault occurred and go through a chain of three different people to find a sensor that was fitted five years ago. But because we've got records and because we know these people, we can do that and we can fix it. And eventually, 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 we end up with what will be our published data set. And that has an incredible amount of work built into it and an incredible amount of effort by people here, people in this room, but all the way down to um, the, the fitters, the installers, the maintenance crews who support the networks and the participants themselves that allow the data to be collected. So um, yeah, don't us underestimate that and we've done the hard work so you don't have to. So um, on that note, I, I'm going to pass it back to Joy and um, yeah, um, we'll take some questions. Thank you. Well, I think that you'll find that that was incredibly comprehensive. Um, it's a real comprehensive um, overview of smart line, the sensors, and how it actually works to create healthy homes, and all the different initiatives and all the different intuitiveness of the system, which enable us to look at how it can help with the health and well-being of our communities and the health and well-being across Cornwall. So, without further ado, I'd like to ask our public health colleague Anthony Ball to join us on the panel. And as per previously, uh, anybody got any questions, if you can put your hands up and the microphone will find its way to you. Hi, uh, um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Uh, my name is Andy Crouch from Acumen. Uh, we've got some really cool kick-ass technology, but what I think the question I want to ask, I think Dr. Tim is, often that's lost in the application to the user. And you noted that some of your uh, occupant research participants didn't long-term use, so there was a loss of potential value there. I'd be absolutely fascinated to find out any ideas you have to improve engagement and long-term use. Uh, we always describe it as it's got to be worthwhile, but that can be very complex in our experience. I've got another question later as well, if that's okay, please. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so we had two dashboards actually, one was provided by the original supplier and then the one we co-designed and we still found low use even after we sort of co-designed it. Um, I think it just might be the answer that the usefulness is most for the housing association to be able to look because even if they know a person knows that they've got um, a mold problem, they might not have the capacity to actually deal with that themselves um, or so that the, the useful might, usefulness might really sit the housing association or someone who has the capacity to, to do something about it. I think you'll always find users that are really, really interested in this stuff, but those are probably the people that would be able to, to sort the problem themselves anyway. Um, there's things like gamification and all of that stuff that we, we never investigated, but I, I think that has been successful in certain instances. I, I chat. Do you think the quality of the data as a result of uh, reduced engagement uh, is a concern? As in how it's presented? As in, well, as in if, does, the, does the engagement, the feedback you get from the occupant, if they're, if they're not as engaged, is there a feedback loop there that will negatively, that could be improved uh, data? Um, I'm not totally sure how to answer that question, but um, I, we did have a feedback function on the on the app for, that we could we didn't get any responses in terms of how how we could do improve it further. Perhaps I could chat to you after as well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, hi. Um, we're from Adult Social Care, and we actually cover that patch in Coastline. So I'm interested in the data. Um, obviously, we've got the heating and eating problem particularly in, in the Campbell and Redruth area. But I'm also wondering if the sensor data, it could be used for something obviously indicating low temperature, might also indicate 
perhaps somebody with a cognitive impairment and they're not actually recognising that the house is getting cold. And then that might also have then obviously health and wellbeing issues. They might not be eating enough, so it becomes a much bigger issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think so the, the session later, they're going to be talking about a future study that's looking at, um, at, at the effects kind of that are going to happen over this winter because of those kind of um, com conflicts. Um, in terms of spotting those issues in the home, the, the dashboard that Tim presented is monitored um, by Coastline and they have, there's a couple of examples that Tim gave where they've intervened particularly with that low temperature drop. Um, and there are other examples as well um, where the intervention has taken place. So I suppose it's, it's probably not my place to speak, but I, th I think that that dashboard view will be useful over the winter as well to, to kind of keep an eye on things. Yeah. I wonder if we want to move on to that question. Um, actually, would love to give a public health <laughs> opinion on that question. Yeah, well, we all work for the same organisation, don't we? So, <laughs> so uh, I mean, I mean, certainly in t terms of that, I think Cornwall Council is sort of leading on responding to the sort of cost of living crisis. So we have a strategic group, so you got all those people there together. And I suppose what this technology is, is giving us an indication of is this is flagging up issues that we need to take via that route. There's lots of support out there, but the people who need it perhaps don't always find out where it is. And we as professionals don't always know where it is, so we need to make sure all our professional colleagues know where to go and get it as well. So, so, so it feeds into all those angles, I think, to say, yeah, exactly. All your colleagues, you know, you might find in that area, unfortunately, it's getting replicated across the whole county and on the Isles of Scilly at the moment. And we need to sort of try and bring as much as we can together to help as many residents as we can. Uh, ultimately, we also know that it will impact positively or negatively currently on people's health and well-being. So we need to drive that forward because currently people are not experiencing fairer life chances for all. And we need to make sure they do actually have uh, that, that fairer life chance to in, in improve their life expectancy and improve their healthy lives. So that's where we're trying to get to. But there's a few forces against us at the minute. <laughs> That last question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Councillor Ollie Monk. I'm the portfolio holder for housing and planning at Cornwall Council. Uh, just, just a question, really. How retrofitable is, is the system that you've explained to us? Is it commercially available? And what does the retrofitted system look like? Is it just simply a case of using the existing broadband router with some sensors that talk to it? and then get put through an app. So just, just a bit interested in those technical questions, thanks. Hi Ollie, thank you for the question. Um, I think what we would say is that the system we have used and been using is not commercial. It was set up purely for a research project, so it's not something that is replicable as we have it. But there are now, and if we were setting up SmartLine again, there are technology has moved on significantly since 2017 in all areas and in sensor technology particularly. And there are commercial sets of companies now out there providing systems similar, not exactly the same because they have different purposes, but very similar that do allow ongoing internal monitoring. And we are talking to some of those and sharing the findings of our project with them and helping them to develop other services. So we know, for example, there are companies that have focused Initially, they focused on fire detection, but now they have environmental monitors and are offering some of this. So I would say, um, as sort of Tim had mentioned, that the potential of this technology is huge. And one of the key challenges is the relationship of the recipient of the data with the householders, because we, as we can see, the householders aren't necessarily where this data needs to go because people have a, a capacity limit in what issues they can deal with. So um, I think, you know, the kind of the question that we've, we were just asked, the, the potential of this technology is to do exactly what you asked. Can it identify households that are in difficulty to then target services, whatever that service may be, to help address the challenge? The challenge back to the service providers is how do we share this information? How do we make it compatible? And how, do, how are we responsive? And how do we understand what the data is telling us? So it's not straightforward. It is complicated. As Rich pointed out, our Lego building activity 
activities have been long and painful over a number of years, and our thanks to Rich for his endurance. Um, but, uh, but yes, potentially that, that is exactly what we could do. These, these things are retrofitable, and there are service, there are commercial companies out there offering this type of technology. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I've been informed that there are some questions on Slider. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions. Um, one from Cheryl, who asks, any plans on how the positive outcomes from it will be rolled out to other landlords nationally or in the private sector? Um, and then a separate question from Alistair Young. Um, for a disrepair claim, a repair has to be reported that the landlord doesn't action. Is there a risk that sensor data not acted on could give rise to a claim? <laughs> um, with regard to rolling out to other housing associations, we have got a project next year that's going to look at the benefits of this technology um, for improving independent living. So thinking about how that might benefit uh, care providers and other health providers and if that's sort of feasible. Um, so that's where it's going next. I, I can add to that as well because I can see that uh, uh, as in terms of public health, as we've sort of been coming out of COVID, we're able to look back at all the things we should be doing, not all the things we've been reacting to. And, and one, one of them is we've been building up our links with the uh, NHS teams in terms of respiratory illnesses. And so we've got a good partnership with that uh, group or cohort of, of uh, professionals. But also that's telling us where they actually know where all the, their patients live. And so I can see, I, you know, I was sort of sitting here this morning thinking, all oh, right, hang on, we've got a good link here. We need to explore that link to see, right, how can we possibly fit sensors in all those properties, all tenures, so not purely a housing association, all tenures, and see if that's telling the NHS when an issue could be uh, coming towards them, as well as is their treatment working? And we, and we know a lot of cases, you know, medication might work, but if you don't change the home environment, is the medication you know worth it really? So, so I can I can see sort of lessons there and sort of possible future options for us. I think there. Okay, and there was another part of the um, about um, disrepair. <laughs> disrepair from Alistair Young. And um, what I, I I wouldn't expect the panel to be answering that question, but what I would say is the um, benefits of this technology to enable us to ask a supplementary question which is which is more um, dangerous or worrying which is a house without a sensor or a house with a sensor and so that's so I'll, I shall throw that out there um, to the group thank you all for your questions if you have any more questions feel free to find any of the panel members during the break and have a little bit of a chat or contact, get their contact details and talk to them after the conference. Thanks to the panel and thanks very much for that session.